All right, thank you, Shannon. So welcome to today's presentation on gopher tortoises in Florida. We are going to discuss some general information as it relates to the Florida gopher tortoise, go over some basic biology and maybe a little bit more than basic biology. And then of course, Shannon and I always love to wrap up with ways you can help. And with the gopher tortoises, there's actually a lot of ways you can help. So I'm excited to wrap up with that at the end. So when it comes to the gopher tortoise, we have over 30 species of turtles here in Florida. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page with what uh, we're talking about when we are discussing the gopher tortoise, it is on average, at maturity between nine and 11 inches long. So it's a pretty large tortoise. They have these stumpy hind feet, which is a kind of indicator of tortoise uh, versus turtle. They have these incredibly strong, and you can see like, they almost look like armor plates on their arms for their forelimbs designed for digging and excavating their burrows, which we'll talk a lot about later on in the presentation. Their shell overall is an oblong shape, so it's more oval, longer than it is wide. And they can vary quite a bit when it comes to color. So I tried to highlight that on your screen here. So you can see the image on the right is more of like a orangish brown. The gopher tortoise on your left is more of a gray. And then the image that's in the middle is a hatchling gopher tortoise. So super, super cute. We have a few pictures of those throughout today's presentation, but you can see that they vary quite a bit from the adults in terms of color and appearance. So they're, they kind of have like a yellowy brown color to them. Some things to note, I've alluded to this a little bit, but the gopher tortoise is a terrestrial species. So they are not aquatic, not found in water. Of course they will drink water, but they are not gonna be found swimming in the water so well we'll get to that later when we talk about helping them but we never want to relocate a gopher tortoise into any body of water that's not what they're designed for they are shelled for life so i've been asked i'm sure shannon has been asked as well if turtles or tortoises can if they change shells throughout their life and they do not they're actually fused to their back and so if you've ever found a gopher tortoise shell or any tortoise shell really you can actually look in there and see where the spine is attached to the body of the gopher tortoise now gopher tortoises are considered ectotherms so they're cold-blooded they need the warmth of the atmosphere and the sun to regulate their body temperature so they're going to be most active when it's warmer so in, during the day so mid-morning and mid-afternoon typically when we're like get me inside, that's when the gopher tortoises are like, get me outside. <laughs> um, and so you can look for them at the hottest points of the day. And then something else we often get asked is, is there a way to tell gopher tortoises apart, male versus female? And pretty much the case for all turtle species is not unless you have them in your hand. And the way that you tell is by looking at the underside of the tortoise shell. So that's called the plastron. On a male turtle, it's concave. So it kind of makes this arching shape. On a female, it's gonna be flat on the bottom. So that is the way you can tell a male from a female. Now the gopher tortoise is a protected species. It's currently listed at the state level as threatened and it's had protections dating back to the early 1970s. And they've changed uh, throughout time just due to different human behaviors. And there's actually a really neat appendix in the gopher tortoise management plan, which I'll talk about next, um, that outlines all the different regulations starting back from 1972. If any of you guys are interested in that, you can check that out. And so since the early 1970s, oops, sorry about that. They didn't have a formal management plan up until 2007. That's when the first management plan went into place. And prior to that, they were listed. So they were listed as a threatened species. Then they got changed to a species of special concern, which you might be familiar with. And then 
when they implemented this management plan in 2007, that switched their um, listing back to state threatened. So that is where they currently stand. That plan was revised in 2012 and it goes through 2022. And again, you guys can look and find that on their website. And I will be sending you guys some links to lots of resources, but to the management plan for anyone that's interested in a follow-up email from this webinar. So just kind of big picture, I'm not gonna go in depth on the management plan, it's quite lengthy, but it is a 10 year plan. The overall big, big picture goal is to minimize net loss of gopher tortoises. So they're listed as threatened because their populations have been declining, mostly due to habitat destruction. And so you can see here, um, they wanna minimize the loss, I can't actually even read my full screen, but, um, minimize the loss of the gopher tortoises. And there are several ways that they list this out in the management plan. There's habitat improvements, uh, there's, and through what we call best management practices. So people that are out in the agricultural fields and um, civiculture, so managing trees, people that have a lot of land, basically there's practices that they can implement on their land that will help support gopher tortoises. Um, and overall increase and improve habitat. Part of that goal is to increase the amount of land that's conserved throughout the state, both publicly and privately. Um, enhance and restore populations. And there they're specifically looking at where gopher tortoise populations once existed and were thriving, but have now either been extirpated, they don't exist in that particular area, or their populations are very, very small. So there's targeted efforts there either through relocation or other efforts that the Florida Fish and Wildlife are doing. And then maintaining the gopher tortoise's status as a key, keystone species. Um, and we'll talk more about what that means, but essentially just thinking bigger picture, not just focusing on the gopher tortoise itself, but all the species that the gopher tortoise helps um, to basically survive and just there's, benefits for the gopher tortoise and those other species. And so by protecting those other species, we're also in turn protecting the gopher tortoise. So I mentioned before, the management plan talks about the gopher tortoise serving as a keystone species. So you can see the definition there on your screen, but basically it's a species that several other species essentially rely on for survival or it helps aid um, in their existence. And without this particular species, there would be a negative impact to these other species. And so you can see in the image on your right, this is trying to kind of give a visual for the concept of keystone species, the gopher tortoise at the very top in the middle. And the idea is, you know, supporting that arc of other species. If we were to remove the gopher tortoise, obviously the arc would be weakened and so it just shows the impacts to those other species if the gopher, gopher tortoise was to disappear. So the gopher tortoise, talking about it being a keystone species, there's over 350 species that have been documented to be supported by the gopher tortoise and specifically by its burrow. So not its burrow, so 350 species sounds like a ton and you might be thinking there's, there's no way, but the majority of those are invertebrate species. So think the creepy crawlies, um, but there's actually 60 vertebrate species that have been documented to utilize a gopher tortoise burrow, whether the burrow is active and the tortoise is currently using it or an abandoned gopher tortoise burrow as well can be used as shelter and refuge and the clip I'm gonna show you next just highlights some of the species that have been found living in a gopher tortoise burrow. And so these species we refer to them and in the management plan as well, they call them commensals. And so I just wanted to, we'll do a little aside, a little lesson on this idea of what it means to be a commensal. So there's the concept of an organism being a parasite. And so we call that, so it would have a negative impact which is why you see the negative symbol there. So an example of that would be like mistletoe, if you guys are familiar with the plant. So it actually sucks into the vascular system of a tree 
And so it's negatively impacting the tree, which is where the minus sign comes from, but it's benefiting, right? Because <laughs> it's thriving off this tree, so that's where the plus symbol comes from. Commensalism is just, it's kind of a neutral relationship, um, a plus and then neutral. So all the animals that get to seek refuge in the gopher tortoise burrow, that's a benefit to them, but it's a kind of net zero for the gopher tortoise. There's no real plus for the gopher tortoise having these other species in the burrow, but there's also not really a negative that has been documented. And then there's mutualistic, where it's a win-win. So um, we often think of that. A common example is the clownfish and the sea anemone. I know I'm kind of going all over the plant and animal kingdom and into the ocean. So we have the clownfish and the sea anemone. The sea anemone gets the clownfish. It's kind of like its little secret protector, but the clownfish gets to hide in the sea anemone that would normally sting other things. And so it serves as a little shelter. So it's a win-win for both. So hopefully this video will work. This is a really cool clip showing of somebody putting a scope down a gopher tortoise burrow and highlighting some of the animals that are found in the burrow. It's a little, um, if you get seasick or car sick, just hold on tight. It, it goes around a little bit. So you can see there's a possum, which is a pretty large vertebrate species that took refuge inside this particular gopher tortoise burrow. And then a cute little mouse. Another vertebrate species, so actually all of these are vertebrate species that get highlighted. And then the next clip is a little bird. I can't positively identify what bird species it is, but Maybe some things you didn't think that would utilize a gopher tortoise burrow, but just trying to highlight visually why gopher tortoises are important and serve as a keystone species. So in terms of their habitats, they can vary quite a bit, but they pretty much prefer areas where there is nice dry sand. So think high and dry because they need to excavate those burrows and so they don't want to be digging through hard clay or anything like that. So the images here kind of highlight the drastic differences. So it can be a pine flatwoods habitat, which is kind of what you would see on the image on your left. So there's not a ton of tree cover, lots of vegetation low on the ground. Um, oops. And then this is actually an image of a gopher tortoise on the coastal sand dune at the beach. So it can vary a lot, maybe in your backyard, depending on where you live. I know I get emails here and there of gopher tortoises in people's yards. So that's awesome if that's you. And hopefully you'll take home some tips on how you can help them after today's webinar. So which of the following is the definition of endemic when we're talking about a species. So the majority of you got it correct. Very good. Yes, an organism that is native and restricted to a certain place. Okay, so this, uh, this slide here shows their range and indicates that they are endemic to the United States, so they're only found in this portion that we're showing here on the screen, um, which you can see ranges from like Southeast South Carolina all the way gets into Louisiana, but not much. In that very Western part of their range, they are um, federally listed um, everywhere else. They are protected. It depends on the state, but um, you can see that they're currently listed as a possible candidate species to be listed at the federal level. So it's basically like under review, but hasn't been officially decided yet. And hopefully we don't get there with the help of this management plan and actions that you guys take at the end when we talk about that. So they're found 
you know, more in Florida than anywhere else in their range. And you can see probably why, because we make up the majority of their range. And they have, despite how the map shows um, kind of the, the listing here, they are found and documented in all 67 counties in the state. And we're the only species that's found west, I'm sorry, east of the Mississippi River. So it's a pretty special species that we have here. And in terms of their diet, um, if you've ever seen gopher tortoise scat, which is the image on the left, more or less always looks like this. Sometimes it might look a little bit more dried out, but you can see the majority of their diet is plants and it varies significantly. Uh, as you can see on the screen, a few species listed there. They have been documented throughout their whole range. So the image I just showed you on the previous slide, there's over 1,100 different species of plants that they have been documented to eat. And one individual gopher tortoise throughout its lifetime can eat anywhere from 160 to 400 species of plants, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> um, and then the 160 number comes into play again because they, the research has shown they typically forage within 160 feet of their burrow. And this is just a fun little clip of one munching away. If you ever get a chance to watch them eat, it's pretty entertaining. They go at it, turn their head, and they just munch away. So in terms of their burrows, I mentioned, we'll talk a little bit more about that. On average, when they dig their burrows, they are 15 feet long, which is a pretty decent size considering they excavate it themselves. The longest on record is 67 feet long, which is crazy. <laughs> they average six and a half feet deep, and that can vary quite a bit. It, um, I think as much as 10 feet I've seen in terms of depth, and that really depends on A, the soil type and just the different layers of the soil, as well as where the water table is. So obviously they don't want to dig into the water table or they will be underwater. Um, so they tend to go just above that water table because it serves as a super perfect little microclimate. It keeps the temperature because the water temperature stays pretty um, regular. It regulates the temperature of their burrow as well. And their shelters are great refuge, as we mentioned before, for hundreds of other species, but for the gopher tortoise, from extreme heat and fires, which I'll talk about a little bit later on uh, when it gets really cold, if it's really, really dry, the relative humidity in a gopher tortoise burrow also stays pretty constant. And then, of course, from predators, especially large ones that can't fit in the burrow. So the gopher tortoise burrow, just some kind of terminology. This is typically what they look like. So the entrance to the burrow is the, if you think of the shape of their shell, if you were to look at them um, straight on. So it's basically just like a little arched um, entryway, flat on the bottom from their bellies. And then there's this big area of sand outside the gopher tortoise burrow and that's referred to as the apron. The apron can be used for basking or also is often utilized for nesting for the females, but it's not always where they nest. And um, in terms of occupancy, as I like to call it, they're typically pretty solitary. There's different research that has, uh, again, depending on habitat, and where they're located throughout the state. They can have more than one gopher tortoise occupy a burrow. It can be the same sex. They can be opposite sex. Um, it can be juveniles or adults. So it really varies. And then they can also have more than one burrow. So there's no real set in stone facts to share, but just know that it can be more than one in there and they can use more than one burrow. If you really want to get into the research, I am going to send you guys a link if you want to dive into that. So in terms of their um, kind of the nitty gritty details of their biology, 
they reach they don't reach sexu sexual maturity until nine to 21 years of age, which is kind of a long time. <laughs> um, March to October is um, kind of prime time for them to start their breeding, um, mid-May to June, and then it takes 80 to 100 days. So once it's 60 days for the egg to form inside the gopher tortoise. And then once the egg is laid, it's 80 to 100 days for that to occur. The majority um, appearing between August and November. Typically only way, laying one clutch a year. It's not, we never, never say never, never say always. <laughs> uh, it's not given every single year that they will lay eggs, but typically if they do, it will only be once a, once a year. Clutch size on average is six eggs. And it's really hard to track and document the age of a gopher tortoise, but the research that we do have available indicates between 40 to 60 years in the wild. And so what's kind of sad to think about is despite all that effort and time that the females put into producing the egg, and waiting for the eggs to hatch, predation, especially on the young hatchlings, is very, very high. When they are uh, um, the size that you see there on the screen, their shells are not quite hardened yet, and so they are a soft, yummy treat for lots of predators, which you can see on your screen, raccoons, foxes, possums, skunks, bobcats. The list goes on. The number one predators for adult gopher tortoises are humans, whether it's due to development, illegal harvesting, or mortality on the road are kind of some of the top threats for adult gopher tortoises. Okay, your last poll question, another true or false. You cannot, true or false, you cannot help a gopher tortoise cross the road because they are protected as a threatened species. The majority of you voted false, and that is correct. So you can help a gopher tortoise cross the road. And so now we're gonna wrap up with several ways that you can help gopher tortoises. So first is that although they are protected, you can help them get out of the road. So the trick is, Obviously, first and foremost, your safety is number one. So you wanna make sure that you assess your scene before you go out in the middle of the road to help a gopher tortoise. But you always wanna put it in the direction that it was already heading. If you bring it back you know, to where it came from, it's just gonna to attempt to cross the road again. So that's the most important piece there. Um, and do not put them in a body of water because they will drown. They're not designed to be swimmers. We mentioned before those big stumpy hind legs. They're just very heavy weighted tortoises and them and water don't mix. <laughs> so um, the other thing you cannot do is put them in your vehicle and transport them anywhere. So another thing I should note that is not in the slide, but anytime if you do touch a gopher tortoise, uh, they can carry diseases and so just always make sure you practice good sanitation if you do touch a gopher tortoise or really any turtle for that matter. So in terms of their burrows, uh, I'm sorry, how you can help, um, you want to protect their burrows from pets. You can plant foraging species in your yard. So the Florida Fish and Wildlife has an amazing resource on their website which I will be sending to you guys that gives you a whole list of different species um, depending on your yard type and different categories of plants that you can plant in your yard to provide an amazing food source for these gopher tortoises that are very very hungry. <laughs> you can encourage prescribed burning if that takes place depending where you are in the state. Um, as development increases it's really hard for land managers to do prescribed burning just because there's lots of restrictions when there's homes in close proximity. So anything we can do to encourage prescribed burning, it helps to maintain really good foraging for the gopher tortoises and maintain their ideal habitat as well. 
And same goes with pine restoration. So that's one of their main habitats that has significantly decreased as development increases. So anything we can do to restore their habitat is a great start. So all of these things and more are listed on the Florida Fish and Wildlife website. If you get overwhelmed with all the ways you can help, you can volunteer with Florida Fish and Wildlife. They have a specific volunteer um, page and for, specifically for the gopher tortoise. You can do an internship. You, um, I'm gonna, on the next two slides, there's some ways you can participate in citizen science as well. We ask that you, this goes for all wildlife, do not feed the gopher tortoise. There's plenty of natural food out there for them, so they do not need to be supplemented with human food that their stomachs are not designed to digest. As I mentioned before, keeping your pets away from the tortoises themselves and also their burrow. If you do encounter an injured gopher tortoise, you can reach out to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator or contact the Florida Fish and Wildlife. And I have their information on, I think the next slide, or anyway, in a couple slides, I have that information and we'll send it out if you're not able to write it down in time. And they also have informational sign kind of ideas and templates on their website. If you have gopher tortoise burrows in your neighborhood or wherever you're located at your workplace that you can print out or design to help bring awareness to the presence of gopher tortoises and ways that other people can help. So one way you can help, this is not an exciting way to help, but it is very important information for the Florida Fish and Wildlife. If you do come across a deceased gopher tortoise, they do want that to be documented. I mentioned before the goal of their overall management plan is to, to reduce net loss of gopher tortoises or no net loss <clears throat> and so they need to know how many are being killed whether it's by natural predators or humans so you can do this through their website they have a link where you can report that there and then using your smartphone kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum they want to document if you have burrows or gopher tortoises in your area so there's an app you can download regardless of your device, as long as you have a smartphone, you can just go to the web store, type in the Florida Gopher Tortoise, and the app will pop up. And it's super user friendly. There's all sorts of information on there as well, but you can snag a picture of the Gopher Tortoise and upload it into their database. You can also access that from their website as well. And of course, if we see anyone in violation of kind of their protected status. If you see anyone harassing gopher tortoises or their burrows or their eggs, you can report that to the Florida Fish and Wildlife hotline. The number is there on your screen. If you don't get a chance to write it down, it's an easy um, web search away. They've added some other easier ways to report violations. They now have, you can call just pound sign FWC or star FWC, and then they even have a way that you can just text now as well. So obviously they're increasing their availability to you in our very technologically advanced world. We're all on our phones, especially right now. So be sure to store this number just so you have it on hand, because this wildlife alert hotline applies to any species if you see somebody doing something you think they should not be doing. And I just wanted to end with something fun. Shannon started with something fun <laughs> with the theme uh, with Star Wars. And so I will wrap up with this little comic, if you want to call it that, that I made up. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in today to learn about the Florida gopher tortoise. And we will wrap up here. Shannon will 